As a teenager, I experienced a fair amount of heartbreak. Um, after falling in love with someone and being in a relationship for some time, my partner would gradually lose interest, becoming distant and indifferent, and eventually deciding to call the whole thing off. And the breakup would often leave me with a sense of despair and sometimes anger. And I wanted to understand why. I wanted to know how it was that something so sweet could turn so sour. I wanted to understand this thing called love. In my search for answers, I came across a great deal of scientific literature on neurochemicals in the brain. Um, I came to understand the biological nature of physical attraction, sexual arousal, and pair bonding. I came to understand that during these interactions, the brain releases a number of chemicals that cause us to feel euphoric, urging us not only to procreate, but to remain with a partner for a particular length of time. And what I concluded from all of this was that love was nothing more than a biological function of the brain, a chemical cocktail, and a temporary one at that. Now, do I still believe this? Not quite. And I'm not suggesting that the science isn't accurate. It's actually very precise. It does explain a lot about why we feel the way we do when we begin engaging with a new partner. And it does reveal that much of what we feel is transitory and misleading. That is to say that we're experiencing a high as a result of these neurochemical reactions. In fact, some of the chemicals involved in this process are the same ones that are triggered by drugs such as cocaine and meth. And just as a drug addict experiences a certain degree of withdrawal, so does the love addict in the form of melancholy and loneliness. What I've come to understand in the years since is that these scientific findings don't really explain anything at all about love because love is something entirely different. What these findings pertain to are feelings of attraction, arousal, and infatuation, which unfortunately we tend to mistake for love. And it's because we confuse these feelings with love that we rarely truly experience it. And I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with these feelings. They're perfectly natural after all and very much necessary for the survival of our species, but it's important to understand them, to be aware of them, especially as they present themselves. It's important to be able to distinguish between these feelings and authentic love. One is intrinsic to the body, and particularly the brain, while the other is intrinsic of the soul. One of the reasons why love seems so difficult to find is because we grasp at illusions. We grasp onto transient emotions, thinking that it's love, and so it clouds us from going any deeper. Infatuation, attachment, lust, and similar emotions become barriers to discovering the authentic love that lies dormant within us. And not only this, but we also tend to maintain a number of other illusions concerning love, mostly uh, conceptual uh, constructs, this sort of thing. So when it comes to relationships, we all have some fantasy of how our ideal partner would be, or what a relationship is supposed to look like, and a great deal of this comes from social conditioning, from literature, music, and films. We talk about our dream partner, and sometimes we think we found that person.
But often we find that after some time has passed, the euphoria begins to wear off. And this is in part due to the brain no longer producing the chemicals, which I spoke of earlier. But this also has to do with our own projections. Um, the person that we're with is not who they initially appeared to be. They may fall short of some of our expectations, or worse, they may turn out to be quite the opposite of what we had imagined. We find ourselves disappointed and even frustrated, and we find ourselves falling out of love. The problem isn't necessarily with the other person, however. The problem often lies with us and our imagination, our fantasy, our projections and expectations. We imagine what the perfect partner would be like, what the perfect relationship would be like, and we look for someone who seems to fit that ideal. And when we meet someone who comes close to that, we try to project that ideal onto them. In some cases it seems to fit, but it may require that we exaggerate their desirable qualities while at the same time ignoring or downplaying their undesirable qualities. The other thing is that it takes time to really get to know someone, and in the initial phase, there's so much we don't know, and so we tend to fill those gaps with our imagination. Because we're caught up in fantasy and imagination, we see everything through a narrow and clouded filter. We see only what we really want to see, only what fits with our ideal what fits with our imagined uh, projection, our expectations, even if we have to reshape things a little. And it's not entirely in our own head either. The other person is likely filtering their own behavior, giving you the best of themselves while hiding or downplaying their own imperfections. We want to please one another. We want to secure the other person, to secure the relationship. So we tend to go out of our way to be a little bit more desirable, a little more attentive and affectionate, a little more agreeable and pleasant, and to distract from any qualities that the other person might find displeasing or unattractive. Often it's as if we're interviewing for a position, so we're on our best behavior. We want to convince the other that we're the most suited for that position, and so we put forth a little extra effort to please. But once we secure the position, and we're a little more comfortable, we gradually decrease that effort and our authentic temperaments and habits begin to come back out. Even if we're able to recognize in the beginning some of the undesirable qualities in the other person, we might do so with the expectation that these qualities are going to change over time. We might see someone as having great potential but the truth is that within each of us lies enormous and unbounded potential. And while everyone has this potential, very few actually exercise it. So recognizing the undesirable qualities in this way is not acceptance. There's still that desire for the person to eventually change, to live up to that potential. This means that we don't accept them as they are presently. We have this expectation for them to become something different. And the reality is that people seldom live up to our expectations. So in the beginning of the relationship, there is so much illusion, so much fantasy. 
But we like that. It makes things exciting and passionate. But the problem with illusion is that it's very difficult to maintain. In the beginning, we're trying to appease one another. Whether we realize it or not, we're trying to keep that person's attention and interest. But once we feel like we've secured the relationship, we begin to relax. We begin to settle down and revert back to our regular way of behaving. And this is when the relationship tends to become dull or dissatisfying. This is when tension and conflict begins to arise. And we think that the other person has changed, but really they've just reverted back to their usual normal self. For a while they were playing a game, likely completely unaware of it, just as you're likely unaware of your own game. But now you're truly beginning to see one another more authentically. Also, your perspective is broadening. You're no longer focused primarily on the desirable qualities. Now you're beginning to notice the flaws and imperfections. It might be that the flaws and imperfections are becoming harder and harder to ignore. And there's nothing wrong with this, but it seems like such a drastic change because we compare that reality to the image we had of them. We compare, uh, we compare it to the fantasy which is now beginning to fade. So we need to be very aware of the illusions that we hold concerning love and relationships because this is actually what creates so much of the conflict. We think that the other is to blame for not living up to our standards, not meeting our needs, and the truth is that they aren't living up to our illusions and expectations. And it isn't their responsibility to do so. These are your illusions, so you have to recognize that and own up to them. You have to take responsibility for your disappointment by taking responsibility for your expectations. It's this point in the relationship when love is truly tested, because those illusions which we so often mistake for love are beginning to wear thin. And, uh, I mean, they're temporary and they can't last. So, if there's no genuine love existing beneath them, then there's no real foundation for a healthy relationship and the whole thing collapses. So, if we want to have a relationship that is healthy and strong, then we need to understand all of this. We need to take a realistic approach. And this isn't to say that we can't enjoy the initial euphoria of infatuation, but we have to understand the, the chemical um, influence. And like any drug, it's going to wear off at some point. So the question is, can we embrace the reality? Can we also appreciate the relationship in its authenticity? And I'm not suggesting that the reality has to be dull or bleak or boring. It usually only appears that way because we compare it to the grandiose illusions that we have about love. It only appears that way when it doesn't measure up to our expectations. So if we hold someone to an unrealistic ideal, then naturally it's going to disappoint us. But if we embrace the reality of the relationship and truly accept one another with gratitude and appreciation, then we can love very deeply. There can be a real joy in the stability and consistency in the familiarity. There can be a real lasting intimacy. We crave excitement. We want 
burning, fiery passion. But if you want a fire that lasts all throughout the night, you don't put all the wood on at once. A fire that burns too hot dies out very quickly. And this is why uh, so many relationships don't last very long. There can still be passion in a long-term relationship, but to expect passion at every moment is unrealistic. The problem isn't that passion naturally withers from relationships as they evolve. The problem is that we want passion all the time. And more than this, we expect it, we demand it. But what we fail to realize is that anything we do regularly becomes regular. In other words, if we're passionate all the time, it would naturally lose its excitement. It wouldn't be passion anymore. Passion is exciting because it's short-lived. It's infrequent. It arrives in waves, rising and falling. But if we demand passion to remain in a state of constant consistency, we can actually end up killing it. Imagine there's a machine that can measure the frequency of relationship energy in waves. And the nature of waves is that they rise and fall. So if you get a peak, it's always followed by a trough, which is a low point equal to the amplitude of the peak. So the peak in this situation represents excitement and spontaneity. And the trough represents calmness and routine. And excitement and spontaneity are what create a sense of passion. Calmness and routine are what we generally consider to be dull and uninteresting. And the higher the peak, the lower the trough. So this means that if the passion is extremely hot, it will likely be followed by extreme coolness. And if we crave passion very strongly, then we have a tendency to resist that coolness and create excitement through tension and conflict. So in other words, a relationship that is extremely passionate is also likely to be extremely dramatic and unstable. And these kinds of relationships generally don't last very long. There's usually a lot of agitation, anger, and fighting, which eventually leads to a sudden and dramatic breakup. Now, we don't want a flat line either, because that would mean that the relationship is dead. What we want is a healthy pulse, a smooth fluctuation. So there will be times in every relationship when we feel really close and connected. And there will be times when we don't feel so close or when we feel that we need space. There's going to be times when we agree and there's going to be times when we disagree. There will be things our partner does that we enjoy and there will be things that irritate us. And so the key is to maintain a balance. But as long as we impose our ideals and expectations upon one another, there will always be disappointment and tension and therefore disharmony and imbalance. So can we recognize and examine our illusions? Can we bring awareness to them and to see them for what they are and, and then to release them? Because perhaps then we can truly be present with the reality of the relationship, with the actual instead of the imaginary. And then we can be in a space of acceptance and appreciation 
And when we're in that space, there is so much more room for genuine love to blossom.